All right, so we've just uh, ticked over to five past, so let's get underway. Um, if you've just joined us, my name is James Curran. Uh, I'm an Associate Professor at the University of Sydney, Academic Director of the Australian Computing Academy and CEO at Grok Learning. Um, and I'm joined uh, by my colleague, Jane Abrams. Jane, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, I'm the Content and Learning Manager at Grok. Um, I've been at Grok for about four years. Um, and part of my role is, um, is producing our new challenge content each year with our, with our wonderful team. Yeah, so we're gonna be talking about some of the great work that um, Jane and the gang have been adding to the NCSS challenge uh, a little bit later on in the webinar. So before we go any further, I'd like to begin by acknowledging and paying respect to the traditional owners of the land on which we're all sitting um, in Zoom in various places. I live right next to Sydney Uni, so that's the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. Um, and, uh, and I wish to acknowledge and pay respects to any um, uh, Indigenous people who are with us today. So what we're going to cover in today's um, webinar is, first of all, we're going to talk a little bit on, about unpacking the digital technologies curriculum and pointing you to uh, an Australian, uh, a resource that the Australian Computing Academy has put together for unpacking the curriculum. And that'll actually give us a few of the concepts that we need to then talk about the NCSS challenge. We're going to do an introduction to the challenge. And, and at the very beginning of that, I'm going to ask three former NCSS challenge students um, Eva, Cassandra and Liam to say a few words about their experience of the challenge and their three different places in their, um, uh, their computing career journey. So we'll hear a little bit about what, uh, what it did for them. And then we'll get on to actually looking at the challenge itself in terms of functionality like the interactive steps and automated marking, um, tutor dashboard, uh, sorry, the teacher dashboard and live classrooms and the tutoring interface. We'll talk a bit about the three different streams and how you can get your students involved. And then we're gonna finish up talking about some of the things that have changed, particularly in the intermediate and advanced stream for 2020. Okay, so, uh, so the first thing I want to talk about is the unpacking website. So the Australian Computing Academy has developed a um, uh, a website called Unpacking the Curriculum. And what it does is it actually draws uh, out the 10 key concepts that the curriculum has been defined in terms of. Those 10 key concepts are abstraction, digital systems, data representation, data collection and data interpretation, the specification of a problem, its solution as an algorithm, the implementation of that solution in code or some other form of automation, the impact of um, uh, digital technologies and the evaluation of them. And finally, the different kinds of interactions, either human to human interactions or human computer interactions. And I'm just gonna flick you over now to have a look at that. Now, in terms of the NCSS challenge, the main areas we're looking at are implementation. So the NCSS challenge is a coding activity and that's where coding lives. Um, it's also going to be a bit about algorithms because every time you're doing a coding task, there is an underlying algorithm that you're implementing. There are some aspects of data representation that we'll talk about when we look at the particular streams. And finally, we also touch on specification because all of the problems um, uh, are defined in terms of a specification of the task that students need to solve. But let me just take you over to um, the unpacking website. Um, just see a, um, I'm just going to clear all. Can I get a tick if you've um, uh, seen or used the um, unpacking site before while I'm talking about it? So just go to participants if you haven't used the feature before in Zoom and then you can tick yes or no if you haven't used it before and then we'll, we'll go from there. So the unpacking site basically um, takes each of the content descriptions from each band, so that's foundation to year two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine, ten, and then aligns them with the key concept. Um, there are different ways you can then slice and dice the curriculum on the basis of that. So, for example, let's take the year five, six um, uh, digital technologies curriculum, and we want to unpack that. And what you'll see if you unpack in this direction, I'll just zoom it in a little bit more is you get first of all the band description and then you get highlighting within the band description and then 
the achievement standard that shows which of the content descriptions in the curriculum that that corresponds to. So let's look at one of the ones we're going to talk about today. So implement their digital solutions, including a visual program. And we're going to talk about visual programming in a minute. If you click on that, it then takes you down to the specific content description that corresponds to that bit of the achievement standard. And um, if you mouse over each of these descriptions here, you'll see that it highlights particular fragments or what we're calling elements of um, each of the, the content descriptions. And that's because when we wrote the Australian curriculum, um, we had a very tight budget on the number of words we could use to describe each of the content descriptions. So here, it's extremely succinct. In year five, six, students are expected to implement digital solutions, um, in this case, code, as simple visual programs. So using things like Scratch or Blockly, as we'll see later on. And those visual programs need to involve branching, iteration, and user input. And here you can see that there's a brief description of each of those different elements. Um, and we found that teachers find this very useful for unpacking exactly what that dense language of the curriculum expects in the classroom. Um, you can also then choose, so we've now, this is on the basis of an individual band. We can also go in the reverse direction and say, well, how does a particular um, key concepts like implementation actually get developed across multiple bands and you can then switch to the reverse view and see for example let's go down and look at an idea like branching we can see how that branching actually changes across the different bands of the curriculum um, to the point where by the time you're in year nine and ten we're just talking about control structures as a group rather than branching as a particular control structure so um, when we're talking about um, the, the coverage of the Australian curriculum in the NCSS challenge or in the New South Wales and WA variants of the Australian curriculum, we're going to be talking largely in terms of these key concepts. So feel free to have um, in a browser in front of you aca.edu.au slash curriculum open um, so you can unpack some of that description as we start talking about it. Um, in the NCSS challenge. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to turn my screen sharing um, off for a moment and I'm now going to uh, have a chance to talk to um, three of our uh, former NCSS challenge students and I'm going to start um, with uh, Liam. You want to unmute yourself there Liam? Liam, yeah, when James. did you first participate in the NCSS challenge? Yeah, so I first did the challenge in 2012. Um, so coming up on 10 years ago now. Um, and that was when I was in, in year 12, just before going up to university. Uh huh. And um, in terms of participating in the challenge, what did, what did you like about it when you were in year 12? What was the thing that got you excited? Yeah, so I, I've been interested in programming for a little while, but I'd only had very limited opportunities to do it. We'd had a high school robotics course where I got to do like a smidge of programming. Um, and I was currently doing the only uh, programming course that was offered uh, at school at the time, which was in Java and making Java applets all day, which um, was, you know, interesting, but again, limited. Um, and I'd heard about the NCSS challenge and figured that this was my last year to give it a go. So I might as well. Um, and I signed up to the advanced challenge because I was a big year 12. I mean, what's the worst that could happen? Um, and yeah, that was uh, a really good decision in some ways because it showed me just how complex and deep the thinking and the problem solving could get. Mm -hmm. um, and I came away with maybe understanding about half the content that was covered at the level that I would have needed to solve all the problems, but it really gave me a thirst for more. And that was when I knew that I wanted to stick with it through university and into my later career path. Right. So let's talk a little bit about that later career path. What are you doing now? Yeah. So now I'm a software developer at Wise Tech Global, which is um, an Australian based uh, software company. Our head office is here in Sydney. Um, and I'm a .NET developer there, so writing C Sharp uh, enterprise application code. Um, and the uh, main product that I'm working on is um, related to uh, managing the logistic and logistics and supply chain industry. 
uh, throughout um, the world. Not, not at all important right now when everyone is only buying things online and sending many, many boxes around the world. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I'm actually in a sub team which is focusing specifically on e-commerce. So uh, our team is suddenly um, in a lot of demand within the company. Fantastic. And in fact, you're the first person I'm going to ring when my packages don't turn up when I expect them to. I had a big Lego shipment that I've been watching come from uh, uh, the Netherlands for about a month. Um, you were the first person I was going to call if it didn't turn up in time for Thomas's birthday. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, maybe, maybe you can pitch those uh, freight forwarders that they should uh, give, <laughs> give our software a try instead. Will do. Thanks, Liam. All right. So uh, actually, I had one more question. I forgot my Lego story interrupted me. Um, uh, so when you, what is the thing that you think you still use the most at work that you first came across in the, in the challenge? What idea Ooh. or skill? Yeah, um, I think uh, the NCSS challenge was the first time where I ever had to really properly debug something. Nice. Um, going Great. into the going into the advanced challenge, some of those uh, questions had a lot of different moving parts, um, and dealing with the different test cases and the and the hidden test cases. You know, trying to figure out. Okay, I know my problem. My my program kind of works, but it doesn't always work. And how can I figure out what's holding that up? Um, and that's something that I do all the time now at work. I probably spend somewhere between thirty and fifty percent of my actual coding time. In a, in a Visual Studio debugger, um, you know, trying to figure out what's what's not working. We're dealing with a, a massive enterprise code base here with, you know, literally millions of lines of code that have been written by people over 20 years. So figuring out all, how all those components fit together um, is definitely a big part of it. Yeah, and I think that's one of the things that is a surprise to non-developers is the portion of your time that you actually don't spend writing new code but you actually spend time getting the code that you've already written or other people's code actually working or, or dealing with bugs. And in fact, that I think that's one of the great things about the challenge is you spend a lot of time with the auto marker telling you, ah, you haven't quite got all of those bugs out yet. Great. Yeah. Thanks, Liam. All right. So Thanks, we're now going to move on to uh, Cassandra de Bona. Um, uh, Cass, what are you doing now? Um, I'm currently a fourth year mechatronics engineering student at the University of Sydney. Uh -huh. And when did you do the NCSS challenge? Uh, sometime in high school. I can't quite remember which exact year I started, but I kept trying to do it every single year after that. Uh -huh. um, and what, yeah. what first appealed to you about the challenge? I think it was um, mainly the structure that the challenges had um, in the idea that it was an actual challenge um, where uh, you're gaining points and you're self-motivating um, yourself to actually learn. So I never actually did the challenge as part of my schoolwork. Um, mm -hmm. We were given the ability to do it outside of school, but a lot of the skills that we learned from the challenge were applicable um, within a lot of the schoolwork that we did. Yeah. And how, how useful did you find the challenge when you uh, started at uni, um, both in terms of IT subjects, but also mechatronics? Yeah, um, so it was super useful. Uh, one of the main um, skills that I learned was abstraction, um, which was take a problem that, uh, for example, the challenge might give you, um, and then break it up into smaller steps. Um, and how do you make sure that the end product is completely correct um, before you even start testing it? Um, so thinking about um, where you might start in terms of, uh, would you rather do a top-down decision of designing or um, bottom-up? Fantastic. And you managed to hit one of the 10 key concepts from the Australian curriculum into the bargain. Uh, I have to tell you, audience, I didn't pay for that, but that was a fantastic answer. Um, and uh, since um, Liam didn't cover it, and although Liam went along as well, you came along to the NCSS summer school. How did that flow on from the challenge for you? Yeah, um, so um, as part of the NCSS challenge, I actually did one of them um, as a GPN student and as a girls programming network student. Um, we learn more, 
or Python um, and a face-to-face -face, uh, environment, um, which is a super duper good community to be a part of um, as there's a really good uh, community network. Um, from there, I learned about the summer school um, and at the summer school, it's uh, basically GPN for 10 days on steroids. Um, it's amazing. The kids don't actually um, take steroids to be clear. No, we don't, um, but it is an amazing experience. Um, you learn people skills, um, such as how to interact with other students, um, which is great for uh, learning about teamwork and how to uh, take a problem that needs about 12 different people to solve. Um, and how do you break that up into smaller segments so that each of you are doing a productive part so that everyone feels included in the final product? Oh, and you've just hit another key concept in digital technologies, human-human <laughs> interaction, collaboration. Nice one. Thanks, Cass. All right, Eva, we'll move on to you. What are you doing now? Um, so I've just finished my first semester at the University of Sydney doing a Bachelor of Advanced Computing. And when did you first do the challenge? Uh, so I did it first in 2015 when I was in year eight. It was actually after we had chosen our electives and I did the first week of it and immediately put in a form to do IST, change to IST. I didn't realise we'd uh, managed to change. What elective did you drop? I think photography. <laughs> oh, nice. Good choice. Good choice for digital technology. So, so you were doing the challenge for a bunch of years then before um, you started uni. Why that first week when you decided to switch, what, what convinced you? What was the thing? I just found it so satisfying. I think something about the kind of really firm structure and the logic of it just really clicked for me and really made sense. And I found, I just, you know, I continued doing it. I did IST, I did software design and development for my HSC. I went to the camp. I just, it just felt right and was very like structured and logical and I really enjoyed it. Good. And so since, you know, the others are already well past first year, so they've probably <laughs> forgotten that, you know, what that experience is like. How did the, how did the challenge help you um, uh, conquer first semester, first year uni? Was it a help? Yeah, I definitely. So I think one of the main things, because our main programming subject was in Python, I had, because I'd been doing the challenge for so many years, I had such a kind of firm grasp on the basics that, uh, starting a problem I didn't have to remember the seven things I could use to do it I kind of they were really familiar to me and I could um, do them but also kind of having an idea of like how you approach a problem um, starting from like a very abstract des um, description like Cass was saying and going to something much more specific um, and also just the resilience of knowing that no one's code ever worked the first time yeah that's and uh, not giving up at that point yeah resilience is great I, I i think it is actually something i mean i've often said that when you're learning to program it the computer never lets you get away with anything right you get slapped in the face immediately my code doesn't work it's not producing the right output it doesn't compile as a syntax error whatever the you know whatever the things are there's no moment where the computer says sure i'll give you a free pass i'll work out what you mean um, and so that resilience of, of getting uh, the slap almost straight away and then having to go, yeah, okay, I, no need to panic. I can work out what this error message means or I can, you know, I mean, that's essentially what Liam just described as 50% of his job. Um, and so getting that confidence um, from doing that over a number of years can't be, uh, can't be underestimated at the start of uni. So, and, and just finally then, um, uh, semester one, pretty much an online experience for, for yeah. most students. Did the, did the challenge prepare you in any way for, for online learning because you were, you were doing it in that kind of mode beforehand? How did that help? Definitely. I think, so I obviously like this semester had been mostly online and I was very self-guided doing the challenge as much as my whole year group was doing it. I was a keen bean that would go home and do extra bits. I did the beginner and intermediate stream at the same time because I just was eating it up. Um, um, and so I think, yeah, I was, I've had that kind of sense of self-motivation and I actually ended up doing software design development online as well. And I think going into that, having already had some experience kind of guiding myself and figuring out when everything went wrong, how to fix it. Um, definitely helped. Who knew it was going to be so helpful, but yeah. Yeah, yeah good. 
All right. Well, um, thanks, Eva. So I would normally at this point ask people to kind of clap Liam, <laughs> Cassandra and Eva. And in fact, in Zoom, there is even a uh, clap button. I've just clapped myself. Um, so feel free to do a round of claps. I will do a, a, a closest in-person approximation of that. Um, thanks very much. And I think all three of them you'll see potentially if you're online, um, either you need help yourself getting stuck or um, your students uh, need help. When we later on look at the, um, uh, the tutoring interface, you might be lucky enough to have Liam, Cass or Eva answering your questions. So thanks very much, folks. And now let's move on to talking about the challenge itself. So I'm just going to share my screen again. Okay, so um, uh, let me go back to the main interface. So when you log into Grok Learning, um, the first thing you'll see is the uh, is the launch pad, um, and on the launch pad you'll see um, right near the top at the moment. First of all, the most recent courses you've been um, in, and then the current competition, which is the NCSS challenge. You'll see that there are five streams of the challenge. There's the newbie stream, um, which is targeting year five, six students. There's the beginners Blockly and beginners Python stream, which is targeting um, year seven and eight students. And we'll talk about why there's two versions of that stream in a minute. There's the intermediate stream, which moves on from there. So you can do that with more experienced year seven and eight students, but also years nine through to 12. And then there's the advanced stream, which is really uh, a very challenging design for your most advanced students who really need a challenge to push themselves outside of their, their comfort zone. So we're gonna start by going into um, the newbie stream. And the way that the challenge works, I've already got it open here, um, is that um, the challenge runs over five weeks. Today's the first week, each week, um, on Monday morning, a new set of questions and notes uh, are released for the stream. And so you'll see here, um, this is the content from the, the newbie stream. So each week is split into week one, part one, and week one, part two, and so on. Um, you can navigate through the content of the course um, using um, this scroll um, by popping out the uh, menu over here on the side. You can also see your progress um, uh, just by looking at these diamonds and circles, and we'll see in a minute what they actually mean. Um, the, uh, by default, you, I see all of the content, because obviously I run Grok, but you'll actually only see the number of weeks of content that have actually been released up to that particular point. Students have through to the end of the competition to solve the problem. So that'll be Sunday night on the last night of the competition, 9 p.m., they'll have to submit their um, solutions, but uh, you'll have students working at quite different pace. So you might have a student who's still working on content that was released in week three, right through to the final week of the competition. That's perfectly fine, and the tutors will actually be happy to help students um, uh, whichever part of the course that they're in. So- And um, we should note as well that they can earn points on, on any week's content right up until the end of right. the competition as well. Um, and so speaking of points, the way it works is each question is worth 10 points every five attempts of the problem. So on your sixth attempt of the problem, you're going to lose one of the points. So if you get a problem out after uh, six attempts, you'll get nine out of 10. Um, and every five attempts after that, you lose another point, except that you always get at least five out of 10. So if it takes 100 attempts, um, you're still going to get um, a, a pass for that particular question. Now, the way that it works is um, uh, we have a series of content slides like this one here. Um, in many of the streams, the content slides have what we call interactive steps. So an interactive step is a way of encouraging um, students to actually really engage with the content of the slide. Because what we found in the past was on many occasions, a, a student would be stuck and they would ask a tutor for help and the first thing the tutor would need to say, have you actually read the previous slides? And the answer was all too often, no, I jumped straight to the first diamond and tried to solve the first problem. And so we tried to um, encourage students to not only read the problem slides, but to actually interact 
try things, experiment, and that's uh, both the researchers found and we found empirically that when students are experimenting with code, that's when they're learning the best. So here, we're gonna follow the instructions, drag the text into the hole in the print block, and you can see that this first step is now marked as complete. And now the critical thing, of course, is once you've got a bit of code is to actually run it. All of the code snippets in um, the Grok Learning Platform are executable, so I can run that code snippet now and it prints out the output, hello world. Now the next thing is um, uh, to really understand it and understand what's going on, you wanna modify that in some way. So I'm gonna go, hello Jane, put an exclamation mark. You can see here that I've now changed the code and in the ideal case, we now want a student before they run at that final time is to try and predict what the behavior is in their mind um, and then run it to confirm. So you can see we've run this last um, step of the process. There was confetti on the screen. I've solved, uh, I've completed my first task and you can see now on the left hand side, um, uh, the uh, circle is now green to indicate that I've completed that slide. And as a teacher, you can see exactly what slides um, I've been completing as a student and we'll show you how that works on the live dashboard shortly. Now, normally we'd kind of um, follow our way through all of these, these steps here and sometimes we deliberately get students to run a block that doesn't produce expected output. So here, try running the text block on its own. If we run it, we get no output and that's because a text block without a print block doesn't actually produce uh, output to the terminal. So at this point, um, after I've been through the slides and I've been a bit naughty and skipped over one of the slides and you'll be able to see that later on in my record, we now get to having a go at solving our first problem. Um, and again, you'll notice for this very first problem, it's actually something that we've already been asked to do. And really for the first problem, it's a matter of a student actually getting used to the automated marking system, getting used to the, the way that the learning interface here has changed to indicate that we're solving a problem. So here, I'm gonna put that inside. Now, the difference is the run button is now over here on the right hand side at the top. We can run the code. We should check that the output of that program matches the expected output in the original question. And one of the things that we've found that students often struggle with and we'll talk a little bit about this more in a minute, is students need to do exactly what the question asks. So the marking system is deliberately quite pedantic, um, and we'll talk about why that is in a jiffy. We can then feed this to the automatic marking system to confirm that our program does exactly what's asked of us. And you'll see that the marking system checks a number of things about this program. First of all, did it print out the right words? Did it print out the right white space? Punctuation, capitalization, yes, I've got everything right. And this kind of ties back to one of the things that um, Liam, I think, said earlier, that actually all of those different tests gets you starting to think about, does my code actually do uh, what it's required before you even feed it to um, the automated marking system? Now, while I'm here, just a couple of other things to note. Um, as a teacher, you'll have access, as a verified teacher, you'll have access to the solution. Um, and you'll also have access to the teacher's notes. In some cases, for really simple problems, there's no distinction between those. But on more sophisticated problems, it will actually talk about some of the common ways that students have difficulty solving the problem, um, how it connects to the curriculum and other things like that. Uh, one other thing to note for students that um, have a little bit of difficulty with reading the materials. We've also got um, a narrate button that will actually um, read out the, uh, the content of the, the problem slide and also the note slide. Jane, that's, what have that's I missed? That's just in the newbie stream though, the narration. Yes. Yeah, currently. Um, um, hope to but if that's something streams. you'd like to see in the other streams or you particularly uh, think is particularly important, then uh, we'd love to get feedback from you um, to, uh, to support at Grok Learning just to say, hey, please prioritize this gang. The other thing I want to um, draw your attention to is in, the, um, in some streams, the questions um, come in pairs. And the whole point of the pair is that you can use the first problem in a pair. You might choose to do it as a class. You might demonstrate it on the, um, 
uh, on the interactive whiteboard out the front first, and then students might actually go and solve that problem. So that's the I do, we do, um, you do um, model. And the you do is then this, this second problem. So here, I now need to put these blocks in. Um, and you can see I've put them in, but have I put them in the correct order? Well, um, you'll notice first of all, that the interactive steps haven't actually uh, highlighted to indicate I haven't really got it right, but maybe let's feed it to the marking system anyway and see what we get. Um, and you can see that it's given me, um, to show me the, the output that my program has produced and then what the expected output here is. And you'll notice um, we described this as failing a test case but we're very clear about it being not yet. Programming is all about, well, there's a bug, we've got to fix it, we keep working until we solve the problem. So if I swap these around, um, and you'll see this more when we get to the Python version, and you're actually writing these text messages yourself, um, uh, these strings, then you'll see that these, um, these interactive, uh, sorry, the um, automatic marking uh, feedback is, is really quite important. What else, Jane? Um, I think you've covered it pretty well. I was just going to add that um, all of the, uh, the newbies and both beginner streams have paired problems for, for every problem slot. Um, so, so yeah, you can, you can take that approach um, all the way through those streams. Yeah. So um, uh, in terms of the content in the newbies uh, challenge, it covers, first of all, um, starts out with basic um, uh, uh, text um, output. Um, it then talks about variables and then moves on to, um, first of all, a bit of turtle graphics. So let's do an example of a turtle problem. Now, one of the things I'm going to do here is rather than put all of these blocks together in place, I'm going to cheat a little bit and I'm going to go try this solution, which if you're a teacher, you can do. Um, uh, before the end of the competition, but if you're a student, um, you won't be able to see. Um, uh, Jane, you're just about to jump in. Uh, we don't actually release the solutions to the students yeah. at all. So yeah. you won't, exactly. So you, you won't be able to see those as a student, but as a teacher, you can always go and try our solutions. And rather than dragging and dropping the blocks, watch out for this little try this solution button down the bottom. Um, and now if I run this solution, um, you can see that first of all, we're animating the turtle graphics and you can see just like Logo um, uh, and Turtle from the 1980s, it works pretty much the same way, except that this is a blocks version. But now I'm gonna deliberately break the code in some way. Um, I'm just gonna put that, where will I put it? Over there. And now if I run this version, oops, how am I gonna do it? Uh, I wanna change the order, this is better, oops. So if I run this version, you can see that I've not produced a square. Let's see what the marker actually has to say about this solution. So you'll notice that the marker does a few things. It identifies in this dotted line where it should have gone, um, but it's also the marker has picked out bits of the solution the students got correct. The bottom line looks like the example, the right-hand side is good. The top line um, uh, doesn't match the expected output. Um, and so now I can think, well, why did my solution do that? Um, and then I could re reorder these and uh, get the correct answer and feed that through to the, to the marking system. So later on, this challenge then covers um, uh, a bit more about variables and asking for user input. And user input is really critical because that's the first point that a program can become interactive and respond to the environment. And user input is one of those concepts that's um, in the digital technologies curriculum right from uh, the year three, four band. So students need to write code that takes user input and then um, actually responds to that input in interesting ways. So, uh, You'll see that when we start coming into week three, because we have um, if statements and probably one of the easiest forms of user interaction is ask for some user input and then make a decision. So branch in one way or another in the code on the basis of that, um, that decision. Um, 
One other thing that I want to just very quickly mention is um, there's actually a number of other interactive elements. And here's an example of those in the notes to do with turtle graphics and geometry. So um, because the turtle, you need to um, choose a particular angle to turn to draw a shape, but that angle is actually a change from its current direction. Kids will often need to do angle calculations to work out what's the right angle they should turn. Um, and so here we've got things like this interactive component um, to actually uh, make it easier for students to do that. I think that's all I'm going to cover on the, um, uh, the newbies stream. Now what I want to do is switch over to um, the beginner's stream. So there's a beginner's stream in Python and in Blockly. Um, uh, when you first click on a tab from the launch pad, it'll take you to this page and it's worth just mentioning a couple of things. There's a button here that describes the scoring system. There's a button that takes you to um, different leaderboards. And since we're already underway, let's see whether there's um, anyone on the leaderboard. So you can see we've got a bunch of students already um, on the leaderboard here. Um, and uh, then you've got PDF versions of the notes and things like that. And then you can also go, um, if you're a tutor, off to tutor messaging. So if I go back to the course content now and click start competition, then um, you can see here, the beginner's stream starts out uh, with some very similar programs. So you've got your first hello world, but here the key difference is we're now writing this code directly in Python. So I can run this, I can modify the message directly here. So change that to high, run it again. And because we're in Python now, we have to worry about potential um, syntax errors um, and other things like that, except we've deliberately constrained it on some of the first examples so that you don't get caught out by these at the very beginning of, um, uh, of the course. So when we do our first hello world problem, um, you'll notice that um, there are some bits of the code that I actually can't edit. So I'm typing wildly here, but my cursor is on the print keyword, which has been blocked for um, editing. And you'll notice it's not the normal bright um, purple we use for the print keyword. It's slightly dull to indicate it's not editable. Whereas this text here, I can edit that message as much as I like. And so now what I need to do is just on this first problem, I just need to change that to hello world, feed it to the marking system, and I've solved my first problem. Um, uh, and you'll notice that it's running exactly the same kind of test cases against the Python code as it is actually against the Blockly. And that's because actually the Blockly code gets translated into Python. Um, and in fact, if you're looking at the beginners and newbies stream, you'll be able to see the corresponding Python code down the bottom during the, um, during the competition. Um, now, if you move to the next problem, you'll see that in this one, we've actually pulled back the scaffolding. So this time I actually need to solve the problem completely. So now if I go print and I put nothing here and run this code, you're gonna see I'm gonna get a syntax error. And by default, you get the Python syntax errors. This syntax error, then we provide an additional explanation down the bottom that actually helps you interpret um, the Python error messages. So we want you to have the real experience of the Python error messages, but we want you to have that extra bit of scaffolding and explanation um, to help. So now if I do print hello here, for example, and run this version, you can see that it's actually starting to guide me through um, things that may not be obvious to a human are as important, like adding the parentheses in. So um, now I'm gonna add my round brackets in, and now I've got back to a program that produces output. Now the program's not correct at this point, and in fact, if I go hello world and mark this one, I'm going to um, uh, realize that actually I didn't pay careful attention to what the question actually asked me to do. I was still thinking about you know, the slides before. One good tip is that um, copying things is a good idea in programming. So typing something back out is a bad idea. I'm gonna remove that full stop at the end there just to show you what the marking system does. So the goal of the marker is to give you as many ticks back first as it can. Positive feedback, hey, you've got all of these things right, 
but there's something that's just not quite um, correct at the end here. So we're gonna put this full stop on and then feed it back to the marking system and hurrah, we've solved this problem. Now, the beginner's course um, covers everything that's in newbies, but then goes beyond that to cover additional content in um, the uh, year seven and eight part of the digital technologies curriculum. Jane, do you want to say a little bit more about um, what's in beginners? Sure. Um, so the main things that we cover, uh, the, the main thing that we cover in beginners that isn't in newbies uh, is functions, um, because that is, I believe, that the main um, implementation addition in, in year seven and eight. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and that comes and in, in that comes in in week four, um, and. Uh, we've tried to do that in such a way that even if students actually have struggled with some of the earlier content, you can jump forward and start some of that functions concept. So you're actually getting that key idea um, of writing your own functions that is introduced in year seven and eight in the curriculum. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the other thing that's important to note is, you know, we, we do only introduce functions in week four. Many students won't make it to week four. Um, as James mentioned earlier, uh, you may have students working in weeks two or three in week four, I mean week five, and that's, that's perfectly fine. Um, we do also have a course version of this stream, um, which you know, students can jump to if, if, if they want to uh, keep looking at this material in future. Yeah, and what's that course called, Jane? So Python for Beginners. Python, Python for Beginners. So, um, and in fact, um, a number of schools go in the reverse direction and actually use some of our introductory courses before they hit the competition. So they might do, if they're doing Python for a term, they might do um, you know, uh, a few weeks before the challenge in a previous term and then come back and do the challenge as their way of consolidating those skills and the, and the students getting um, further along. All right. I, I should um I should mention that the course version is available all the time. Um, yes. Unlike unlike the challenge, which is only available for five weeks per year. Absolutely. Yes. Thanks, Jane. That was a good point. Um. So, uh, let's talk about a few of the other features of the challenge. So so far, we've really been talking about interactive steps, automated marking, and so on. Um. Let's Jane go and have a look at the um the tutoring interface. So now. I'm going to go back to my um, dashboard here and I'm going to click on teacher dashboard and the teacher dashboard I'm in I uh, have um, uh, I'm attached to multiple schools but I'm going to switch to the Australian Computing Academy demo school you'll probably in all likelihood only have one school um, and what you'll see here is that I have now got records for all of the students that are currently enrolled in this demo school um, James just set up a new um, uh, a new group for the NCSS challenge that's got four students in it. You can look at student progress in terms of um, the old dashboard. So um, you can see, for example, that um, uh, Jane has been active a few seconds ago, but Simpson and Lisa a little bit longer ago, and we'll see exactly what they've been working on in um, in just a minute. Um, you can switch between um, uh, different groups. You can switch between different grades. You can switch between different courses that they're participating in. So let's look at the NCSS Challenge Beginners and you can see exactly where the progress has been so far. So Lisa, Lisa has got two problems out. Jane uh, has, uh, which is why you can see it in green there. Jane has started one problem. Jane's a bit of an embarrassment within Grok sometimes. She can't quite get the content out that we're creating for kids. She's it's got Hello zero World. out so far, but we're gonna drill into that in just a moment. And Millhouse is a mixture of having solved one um, and uh, working on the next one. So that's one view. Something we added to support schools um, uh, due to COVID-19 remote um, teaching is the new live classroom. So if you click on the view live instead, what you'll actually see is progress um, over time. So you'll notice, um, and this is a much more detailed view of exactly what um, students have been working on. So you'll see earlier today, around 3.30, um, there was a burst of activity from Millhouse. So Millhouse viewed the welcome slide, and then the getting started guide and then completed the hello world slide and then um, 
uh, ran um, and uh, then viewed and then ran and then tried to mark the uh, goodnight moon problem that we just solved. And so you can actually see exactly what your students are up to and what slide they're on right now. So if I slide forward to the current time, you can see um, that Jane is currently online. She's viewed um, and stalled on the hello world problem and she's run it and doesn't seem to be getting it out. So we can actually go and click on this now and see exactly where Jane is up to. Um, so Jane looks like she's got a bit of a capitalization problem going on here and um, uh, maybe she could do with a little bit of a help. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to use the tutoring interface to send a, um, uh, a message to Jane. Okay. Um, and so uh, at this point, Jane can now respond. So, um, how about you have a look at uh, the error message in red. And you'll notice that at the same time, as well as me being in, the, um, in this conversation, you'll see that we've actually got tutors um, who are participating in the NCSS challenge right now who are here as well. Um, so we might even see a message from Renee uh, shortly, who's one of our tutors. If I want to, I can send a message to Renee um, using this notes interface. So a note only goes to other tutors and other teachers. It doesn't go to students. So I can say, uh, uh, to the So I can send a message. Um, normally you wouldn't say, hey, Renee, you just send it to the tutors generally because it could be any number of tutors um, who are there at any point. Um, and while uh, Renee's potentially replying, I'm just gonna show you a few other features. So you can actually put, um, this uses Markdown. So um, I could say, um, uh, if I'm getting a little bit, um, uh, more frustrated with um, Jane, I could say. Um, and then if I preview it, you can see that I've now got italics here and this follows the standard markdown convention. The thing that's more interesting is I can also put Python snippets and Blockly snippets in here as well. So, um, Because if I want to get even more um, creative with how I send uh, uh, my messages back. So you notice that if I now send this, um, oops, it's not assigned to me first. So I'm just going to claim that back and then I can run that snippet and send it. So, um, and you'll notice in the meantime, Renee uh, in brackets, Grokka, she's one of the Grok staff, but otherwise it will say tutors. Um, will, uh, you know, can comment as well. So this is a thing that, that either you can use directly as a teacher if your students are stuck, but you can also use it with, um, uh, the, the tutors can also help out. And the tutors are typically online helping out roughly from eight o'clock in the morning, often through until 9 p.m. in the evening. So if you want to set some of the NCSS challenge questions for homework, that's something um, you can do as well. And we can now see, not only that, but we can see that the status of this problem has now changed. So um, Jane has solved it. So I can do, I can go well done here, or if I'm actually back looking on the live dashboard, you can see that um, I can now send another message like a congrats. Um, and I've now sent a congratulatory message through to um, Jane, which is the kind of thing if you were in the classroom, you'd be able to celebrate directly with kids um, when they're with your students when they've solved a particular problem. Now you can do that via 
um, this live classroom interface instead. Um, you can also change the time frame over which it works. So if you've got a class actively doing a lot of stuff, then a whole day can just result in many, many messages. If you switch it to one hour, um, you can then actually just get the most recent hour of work. That was from 12, let's say, where are we at now? Um, four o'clock, let's put that one in there. Then we've just spaced out what Jane is working on. Um, uh, where does Jane see the congrats message? Excellent question, Trish. So, so I can see it. I get a little notification on my um, on my my end, which you cannot currently see. Um, <laughs> uh, you actually there's a little bell you can see on Jane's screen. You might want to um, mouse over that. Uh, you're getting all your. Yeah, I'm getting all my notifications that, that, <laughs> that people have replied to it. Yep, okay, I've got it. Uh, um, so you can see the notification bell there. Yeah. Um, that's an indication. So if I got a, um, a message, it would appear in that notification section there. Alrighty, so I think, um, Jane, it's time for us to jump into the uh, intermediate stream. Um, um, I was just going to say, did you want to talk just quickly on live classroom about the stalled and struggling indicators. Ah, yes, yes, good point. Um, so there's, there's two there. You can see that um, for me, I've got the little uh, clock in the orange um, diamond there. That's because I was sitting on, on the problem while we were talking earlier. Um, so that's a stalled indicator. That means that the student is sitting there with the problem on their screen or a slide on their screen and they're not really doing anything. Uh, it may be that they're off task. It may be that they just don't know what to do. Um, the other, the other indicator is, uh, you can see Milhouse has it. He's got a little, um, red diamond with a question mark inside. Um, that's the, that's the struggling indicator. So you will see that if a student has attempted marking a problem, uh, five or more times, um, and hasn't yet solved it. So that indicates that they're, that they're struggling with the problem, um, and may, may need a hand. And that's a good time to just click on that, go in to see where Millhouse is up to. Millhouse hasn't paid close attention to the question in terms of capitalization. Um, and you can see here it says attempt number six. So Millhouse has had a whole bunch of goes and still hasn't quite noticed what the question is actually asking and what feedback the automated marking system is giving. And in our experience, that's actually not that unusual initially until they get into the rhythm of how the marking system works and how they have to read and do exactly what the question asks. Um, of them. All right, so let's um, quickly move on to Intermedia. I realize we're running a little bit behind schedule. I think I got a bit over enthusiastic about our previous NCSS challenge um, participants. So Jane, do you want to just describe a little bit about what we've added into the Intermediate course this time around? And I'll pull up the first of these um, uh, new types of interactivity. Sure. Uh, so the intermediate stream uh, for the for the challenge that's just started has had a complete overhaul. We've um, completely rewritten all the content. Um, we've come up with a new uh, sequence that more closely aligns with uh, parts of the the year nine ten uh, DET curriculum. Um, and we've also added some of the features that we've added to the newbies and beginner streams earlier. So that's interactive slides um, with with some new bits. Um, so James is going to demo. Uh, one of our new uh, problem, a little slide problem types, which is a, a multiple choice uh, problem. Yeah, um, so, so here the goal is um, uh, to find new and new and varied ways of uh, getting students to interact with the content. So here, which of the following is an iterable? So something that we can loop over. Um, so let me come up and choose one of the correct answers. So you can see down the bottom here, I get a little message. Yes, a string can be treated one character at a time. Um, and you can see that I've now got one of the two uh, correct answers. If I click on an incorrect answer, an integer, it says no, an integer can't be, can only be treated um, as a single item. And then finally, I'm gonna click on my um, range of integers using the range function. And then it explains that solution as well. And you can see that that now ticks off um, the interactive steps. So that's one kind of uh, new structure. Um, now I'm trying to remember where the other one's gone. 
conditions with substrings. That was the one, thank you. So here, what we're trying to do is get students to think about the behavior of code and work out what the answer is going to be uh, ideally without running it. Now at this particular point, we haven't actually enforced that they have to try and come up with an answer beforehand. So one easy way to do that is just to run it and go, okay, I get it. Um, but ideally we want them to actually think about it beforehand. So now uh, in this next one, change the if um, condition so that in becomes not in, what should it pr print out now? Well, the answer is it should print groovy. Now you'll notice that here, um, uh, let's, oops, oh, sorry, clumsy fingers. Where did I go? So, what am I doing wrong, Brian? Uh, well, you have to complete step one again, but oh, this step two step. doesn't complete unless you run the program. Aha, uh -huh. exactly. Thank yes. you. No Maybe there was something. So, here, got to run the program again, and I have to have actually modified it. Uh, in the way that I'm required to. And now you can see that I've completed um, uh, those steps. All right. Um, uh, have I missed any other cases? Of new uh, features? Yeah. Uh, no, but um, you may want to demonstrate uh, what we're doing with interactive uh, steps in the problems in the intermediate yes. stream. Thank you. All right. So let's look at pet purchase then. Um, so one of the bits of feedback we got about interactive steps is that they're good, but often students end up come end up coming to rely on them a little bit too much. So um, we we definitely want, especially by the time students are in the intermediate, and in fact even by the end of beginners, we want to withdraw the scaffolding so that students are able to solve a whole problem, starting with a blank editor and writing out all of the code without telling them what to do. So what we've decided to do this time round is add a thing that we're calling um, tips rather than interactive steps, because we want students to try and solve the problem ideally without actually opening these out. But then you can see that um, these look a lot like the interactive steps that we had in the beginners and newbie streams but they're actually slightly higher level. So you'll notice that they don't say, do exactly this, do exactly this in such small, in such small steps. It's actually a higher level um, abstraction uh, that we're giving in terms of hinting. Um, and so I'm now, gonna, I'm now gonna cheat and steal the solution since I'm running late. So I'm gonna try this solution. Um, and if I go back to the problem and look at the needs and tips, you just have um, to make it. So I have to make a modification. So you can see now that it's ticked all of these off in a different way. Um, one of the things that I'll be interested in getting your feedback at the end of the challenge is, um, did students always pop open the need um, some hints, uh, need some tips, or did they really try and have a go at the problem without that? Because later on, what we might do is maybe introduce a tax. You don't open that. Um, you know, without losing a point potentially or some other inducement for students to try and solve the problem without actually um, uh, uh, looking at the tips beforehand. Um, okay, so I think that's all I wanted to say about um, intermediate. In terms of the advanced stream, um, uh, if you've used the challenge previously, you'll know that over the last couple of years, the advanced stream has actually been um, uh, um, a competition to build a card game agent. So a game, an agent to play the game big two. Um, feedback from teachers said that the gap was just a bit too large between the, or, uh, the intermediate stream and what students needed to do um, for the card game. So we've actually rolled back to a version of the tournament that we last used um, in uh, 2017. So if you've, if you've been with us a long time and participated in the advanced stream, don't be surprised if some of the questions are the same here. The advanced is something that we're looking to make some fairly dramatic improvements to in 2021 and really change the way we're doing it. Um, but the, uh, the 2017 competition covered a number of interesting things. 
So you'll see more advanced Python, um, more in terms of file IO and functions. You'll see uh, advanced constructs like tuples, enumerators, um, uh, and other complex data structures. Later on, we get to object-oriented programming and things like that. So the advanced stream is really designed for that backstop for students that are really just such a long way ahead of most of the class that they need a thing that's going to really stretch them, and the advanced stream does that. All right. Um, so I think the, the final thing that I wanted to point out before we um, go to questions is uh, how do you actually sign students up? Well, um, the answer is that you can do that from um, your teacher dashboard. So if you click back on teacher dashboard, uh, and I'll go back to the demo school, you can see there's a button to register students. So um, that's to create an account, but not necessarily have access to um, the paid activities on the Grok platform. That'll give you access to the DT challenges, to the cybersecurity challenges and any of the Grok learning free content. You can, um, uh, if you want students to participate in the NCSS challenge, then you need to buy subscriptions. And if you click on either of these, um, it's going to give you options. So typically what you do first of all is you register a collection of students. So you go here and this allows you to either upload a, a, uh, an Excel file containing the student data, um, or you can manually enter the students one row at a time. Um, and you'll see if you click on import students that there is the spreadsheet option or now a Google Classroom integration. Once you've, and if you click on the help here, it actually takes you through um, the whole process of doing that um, registration and setting up the Excel file. Um, if we go back here, once you've registered your students or if you've already got a student group, you can go here um, and pick a particular class or group that you might want to register. So we're gonna go add whole class and you now see, well, actually some of the students are already subscribed. I'm gonna just click add them anyway this time round. And you can see that it's now um, basically shown you a draft invoice. So you see exactly um, what your school would be paying. And then when you click on confirm invoice, it then takes you through to the, uh, to the rest of the payment process, which could be I'm going to pay on invoice or I'm going to pay directly using um, a, uh, a credit card. Um, one thing to note, of course, is here the discount code GROCKASSIST2020. So for the remainder of the year, Grok Learning um, is making the um, full uh, subscription through to the end of this year available for 33% off. Um, and that's to help schools and families who are struggling financially or need to have a much larger number of students participate in things like the NCSS challenge um, because they're remote learning than they would otherwise expect. And as always, um, if that discount isn't enough um, to help in your school, we want every student participating who can, then please get in touch with us and we can talk about pricing that will work for you. And I think that pretty much brings us to the end of all of the things that I promised we were going to talk about. So let me just double check, enrolling your students, changes, the challenge streams. Oh, we've done well, Jane. So um, I'm now gonna just quickly pause for any questions. So if you'd like to ask a question, um, feel free to uh, type that question into the group chat. And while you're doing that, I'm just gonna mention um, our next upcoming uh, webinar. So next week, same time, Mondays, four to 5 p.m. Um, and you can find those webinars by going to our short URL, cmp.ac slash webinars. Next week's webinar will be on um, the BBC Microbit. There's one webinar for primary, one webinar for secondary, and that's the start of um, the Australian Computing Academies or continuation of the Australian Computing Academies sequence of webinars that will run um, through the majority of term three. All right, do we have any questions? Jane, anything you want to add while we're just waiting another moment or two for questions? <laughs> um... I, I don't think so. Um, I mean, I think the one thing I was going to add was that it was interesting that um, all of our uh, previous, oh, we've got a question. Is live view available in all courses or just NCSS? 
Uh, Trish, the answer is that live view is available in all courses. It's not related to the challenge. Um, and you can use the tutoring interface as a teacher from uh, all of those uh, courses, not just the NCSS challenge. The tutors, though, um, are only available uh, typically in uh, competitions like the NCSS challenge and web comp, although that, that was one of the features that we actually provided access to to support schools in um, COVID-19 remote learning. Um, we had tutors available for a large number of GROC and ACA courses, and um, that access um, actually continues through until the end of the challenge. So even if you're doing another course or competition, um, you'll have access to tutors as well. Thanks, Trish, great question. No other questions? Uh, oh, can, can students, students continue working? Absolutely, Peter. So students can continue participating in the NCSS challenge in terms of solving the problems afterwards. The only thing that doesn't happen is they won't get um, the, the points for it in the same way and their certificate at the completion um, is for the five weeks of the competition. Whereas if you're doing it in the um, coursework mode, for example, in the Python for beginners, then the certificate reflects your completion of that course, no matter how long it actually takes um, for you to complete the content. Alrighty, well, we might wrap it up there. Um, if you have any further questions, um, then uh, you can, first of all, find the ACA on the ACA website. You can also join our Facebook group, come and say hi on Twitter. If you've got any questions specifically about the NCSS challenge, then you can either log in and ask a question on the particular um, uh, problem that you might have yourself or your students are having. So remember, you can use the tutoring interface to ask the tutors questions if your students are stuck rather than if you're stuck, but also encourage them to use the tutoring interface. If you've got other questions about Grok Learning, then um, feel free to send us an email to support at grocklearning.com. And that's it for the webinar today. Hopefully we'll see many of you back next week for when we're talking about BBC Microbits. And thanks to Jane um, for being my uh, co-host today. Have a good evening, everyone. See you soon. Hey.